Welcome to our podcast, Doing It Right. This podcast reveals authentic stories from successful leaders doing it right. It's about their journey to become a leader, their choices, motivations, and lessons. In essence, how they built successful personal brands. Your host is Valerie Sokolowski, author of eight leadership books and nationally known as an authority on executive presence and personal branding. Let's get started. Here's Valerie. Well, hi again. We're going to have a fun time today. I've got my coffee. I hope you have yours, whatever you're drinking. Just stop, watch the show, pull it down a little bit. I think we all need a break. And today I have a wonderful guest. I had been wanting someone in the restaurant business to come and talk to us about all of the ups and downs that we've been going through. And I'm so grateful, John Kinzer, that you, a restaurateur and entrepreneur, joined us today. You're a fabulous owner of, golly, how many restaurants? Well, four total right now. Two, <laughs> and what two are of they? which are operational, the other two are still in construction. All right, but. tell us what they are. So I own Republic Texas Tavern in Dallas, which okay. is on Inwood Road. I also own uh, Imoto, which means uh, little sister in Japanese. Okay. I own that with uh, Kent Rathbun, Chef Kent Rathbun. He's oh, an Iron famous. Chef. Yeah. yeah. And it's a sushi place in Victory Park. And then I'm going to be opening uh, Pizza Gianna uh, this fall, which is the reboot of Pizza by Marco or My Family's Pizza that was destroyed in the tornado in 2019. Huh. It's been around since 1956. So there's a lot of people in Dallas that are really, really excited that Pizza Gianna uh, is coming. coming the, the Nuccio family is bringing their great pizza sauce back, so we're awesome. excited. And then uh, January, uh, Onisan, which means Big Sister, will be opening as well here in Dallas. It's a sushi and dim sum restaurant. Oh my God. And they're so yeah. different. Yeah. Very, All very so diverse. Different. Yeah. Well, John, tell us your story. When we talked, I was amazed at your path. And you said something just before we started. You said, it's hard to pick your path. So go back and kind of tell us how you got into this from such a diverse path. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, when I got out of the University of Texas, I moved back to Dallas and was working in the real estate industry. And uh, one of my classmates from Jesuit had come to me with a business plan and says, I want to open up this bar. And, and I said, interesting. <laughs> and originally we had looked at one location over on Lover's Denwood and I told him, I thought, you got to go find a place that's not being served right now. So we ultimately built it at uh, Knox Henderson in 75, and it was called the Barley House. And I'm proud to say that the Barley House exists today uh, after being, you know, opening in 1993. That's um, a long... That's a long time. That's a long tenure. Through the yeah. pandemic? Through the, I mean, through a lot of things. So yeah. they relocated it in 2000 to SMU Boulevard. So it's been a, a staple for SMU students ever since. Um, but that was 24 years old. Hey, let's do this. And then ultimately we bought the restaurant next door and added that to the, to the, to the menu. And then I migrated away from the restaurant business, uh, in my, you know, thirties and early part of forties. And then ultimately joined a private equity firm called Lone Star Funds. And they asked me with my extensive restaurant experience, which was one bar and one restaurant, if I would take over the investment oversight of Del Frisco restaurant group sure. and Texas land of cattle and Lone Star Steakhouse. So I went from owning one bar and restaurant to overseeing somewhere near 320 different restaurants. What does overseeing 320 well, restaurants it's, mean? It's, you've got the CEO, CFO, uh, COOs reporting into you. You're making capital decisions. You're making growth decisions. You're making sometimes decisions to, to shut stores, um, mm. renovate stores. Um, you're trying to basically manage the investment, uh, make the right decisions for your investors. Why'd you leave? Uh, well, we were successful in taking Del Frisco Restaurant Group public in 2012. Um, and ultimately, when we sold the remaining shares, we were no longer a owner, if you will, of the company. And so we all resigned from the public board and uh, sold the rest of the restaurant businesses. And basically, I worked myself out of a job. 
Well, sometimes so that's okay. It was it was it was okay. Was so that the good it, thing it for was, you? It was a good thing. So um, after that, my uh, friends um, had asked me to open up a place in the Preston Hollow market of Dallas. Mm -hmm. That we just didn't have a place that was similar to a, a concept I created called Del Frisco Grill, and which very bar centric, great place to meet and have drinks and have a great meal. Um, so I came up with a concept that's. I'm proud to say is doing very, very well now called Republic Texas Tavern. Um, it's kind of a Texas version of Hillstone or Houston's as a lot of people know it. Oh, so sure. it's upscale casual, mm -hmm. uh, very bar centric as well. And we've been open since May of 2017. And, you know, Still. we never shut down during the, during the pandemic, but we did go to basically pick up and delivery only for a short period of time. Uh, let's talk about that for a moment, and and that is how you survived. Oh. <laughs> what did you do differently? Yeah. I want to interrupt a moment before I let you answer this, because I was fascinated when we talked by phone, John, and you said you learned in the past, you learned about new concepts, and you're a visionary. Yeah. Uh, entrepreneurs better be visionary, they right? Have to be, yes. But to be in the restaurant business, that's 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 edgy. What is the concept that you came up with that's different? Well, um, for Republic, it was you know I wanted a place where you felt comfortable walking in if you were in a suit and tie or if you were in flip flops and shorts and a t shirt. Oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah. So it was meant to be just nice enough to where you didn't feel like you were you know there was peanut shells on the floor and it was you know <laughs> but yet at the same time i wanted people to feel comfortable uh-huh uh it was designed to be a neighborhood place so you always knew you were going to see somebody there that you knew um i knew how important it was from my del frisco days on how to train staff to teach staff how to interact with guests mm -hmm. um to pro provide a variety of options um everything from very very nice wine to something that's very affordable and approachable Mm -hmm. um, so you're trying to be, you know, a, a friend to everyone in the neighborhood and, and cater like directly that. to the neighborhood. I never wanted to be, you know, on the front cover of D Magazine or Paper City. That was never the plan. Um, uh, I never, because a lot of places in this town that are popular for a short period of time are out of business in a very short time. So, so yeah. let's go to that. Yeah. The so, pandemic is still with us. Mm -hmm. We don't know how long. We do not. So just uh, whatever you want to share about well, I mean, how you've we stayed sur open. We survived by in, in a couple of ways. One is um, we have an incredible staff. And um, I make it a point to run the business like a little bit like a family. Uh, I take an interest in all my employees. I learn everybody's name. I try to learn something about them so I, so I can connect with them on a personal level. All um, of them? All of them. Yeah, everyone from the dishwasher to... Uh, on up and how so, many employees uh, do you have? it's you know it's 40 to 50 people uh, per restaurant that you have yeah. to be intentional yeah. john to and, do that and I, and I i will meet somebody and i will i'm not the best with names so i may ask them three or four times after they can say please forgive me but remind me of your name one more time mm -hmm. put a name tag on yeah well <laughs> we don't do name tags but my point is, is that you would think that there was like ah, oh, this guy can't remember my name but it's actually quite the opposite it's he's taking the time to really try to figure this out. That's right. And he's got lots of things going on. So, um, you know, also try to lead from the front, which is, you know, I'll walk through uh, the restaurant and I'll see a table that maybe needs to have some dishes removed and I'll pick them up myself. And in inevitably the staff will come up to me and try to take the dishes out of my hand. I'm like, no, no, go grab dishes from another table. So how many owners yeah. do that? uh not many i uh, haven't seen no nah, but it's i think it's it's important that if it's if i can do it then no one has an excuse right Good so for you. that's the way you lead um and we've had some you know some tragedies in in at the restaurant we had a dishwasher get shot one time and is where he lives and mm. was in the hospital and we you know as a restaurant we just wrote a check to his family for a certain amount of money just to help them get through and that's just the right thing to do. So um, that's doing it yeah, right. Yeah, that's doing it right. So yeah. anyway, um, we, you know, you can't solve all the problems in the world. And there are times where it just doesn't work out with an employee. Um, mm -hmm. But for the most part, you know, we try to help as many people as we can and, and include them in our family. 
Well, so, you deserve to stay open. John, what about staying open? What did you do that um, the story I, I want you to share is something you came up with and it started yeah. going? Well, we had to get expanded. extremely creative. Um, you know, I pride myself in thinking outside the box. So if uh, people remember, we shut down on roughly March the 14th, uh, right before St. Patrick's Day, which mm -hmm. is the most depressing St. Patrick's Day I've ever had. Mm -hmm. However, um, we immediately went and decided that we needed to come up with a strategy on how we're going to improve our to-go business. Um, so we came up with a couple ideas and, you know, we were not unique in this idea, but we went and created these family meals. So instead of ordering individual entrees, um, you know, we would order, you know, we would create a, a meal for the night or two. So might, maybe one would be beef fajitas with all the fixings, stuff that would not normally be on our menu. Uh -huh. But that's the beauty of this restaurant is it's chef driven and we can adapt you and can create adapt whatever we and want. Change. So, you know, we may do barbecue one night, we may do uh, Mexican food one night. Um, you know, we were able to use social media to get the word out um, and, you know, we had to come up with those kinds of ideas. We even, you know, came up with what's called cocktail kits. So you could, people that were missing their margarita, their old fashioned, we actually created a kit that you could come and buy and- And take out. Take out and it would have a, a little bottle of bourbon and all the ingredients you needed to make your, your old fashioned with and you would take it home and make it yourself. Now that's and, interesting. Yeah. And then ultimately we had, you know, people when the TABC, I, I give them a lot of credit. Um, they came up and tell them who that, who that is. A Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission yep. uh, actually relaxed a bunch of its rules because they saw just how much pressure was being put on the, on the business, uh, restaurant businesses. So at one point we were allowed to basically make individual cocktails and, and, and serve them to guests with a, with a lid on them and they could pull up and if they needed their, I had a bad day at work, I need a drink and, we would deliver it curbside. So now that's interesting because yeah. what if the police caught them down the road? Well, as long as they're not drinking until they get to the house. Okay. Because remember, the key word is open container, and these were not open containers. There you go. So, okay, I had to ask that. Yeah, but, but there weren't many people on the street in those days, if you can remember. Yes, and I do. I think probably the most creative idea we came up with was um, around Easter. It dawned on me that you know Easter wasn't going to be what it normally is, right? There's not going to be any Easter egg hunts. There's not going to be any of this. So, you know, we decided that we would create an adult Easter basket. <laughs> and so we added, you know, wine and bottles of wine and earplugs for the moms and, <laughs> you know, candy and bath bombs and, you know, things like that into a, ba to a basket. And so I had spent three days running around Dallas buying up every Easter basket and Walgreens, CVS and Target. I love it. And then, you know, we delivered them all over the, the city. And I think we did, I don't know, over 100 of those. Oh, my um, goodness. I, I regret doing free delivery because I didn't realize that some of the people that ordered them were all the way on the other side of Fort Worth. So, oh, no. Bad idea. But anyway. <laughs> but a good idea. It was a good idea. It, and it worked. And, it, and look, you create um, customer loyalty, customer okay. appreciation. Uh, we did other things like remote wine tastings. Mm -hmm. uh, where you could come and buy, you, you'd get the kit and it would be, it'd have half bottles of wine or whatever we we're going to taste. And then mm -hmm. I have a, uh, a great sommelier from Southern Glaciers, uh, Alvaro Amador, who came and you know, we would film him live. And <laughs> you could do your own wine tasting at your house while you're tuned in via Zoom. Who, who would have ever thought that that was going to happen? What a visionary. But, but it happened. So, That's... yeah. So we're, you know, we were very excited when things started to get back to normal. Um, and... You know, as of the last, I guess, three weeks, things have started to take a turn again. Mm -hmm. And so I've asked my staff uh, to go back to wearing masks because I want to make sure that the public feels comfortable. Um, they, the guys in the back of the house have always worn masks because that's the way I want it done. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're just going to have to take it day by day at this point. So I've encouraged everyone to get a vaccination. Uh, I can't force them to get a vaccination. I will not force them to get a vaccination. I was going to say some people are. Yeah, I'm not there. Um, but, you know, the rule is if when we do come out of masks, if you haven't been vaccinated, then you will continue to wear the mask. Mm -hmm. um, and so people, I think, understand it. Um, I'm, I hope that uh, people get vaccinated because I think that's the best way to beat the beat this virus. You've so, got to do something. Yeah. Being an employee of yours with all those creative things that uh, you're doing, what do you, what do you do for them in terms of just growth? 
I come to work at the restaurant, then what? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, you know, typically the restaurant business is fairly transitory. I mean, people come and, you know, depending on the level of the restaurant, you know, your turnover can be anywhere from, you know, 70 to 120% a year, uh, depending on really. So, yeah. So, uh, what, what happened during COVID, which may, has made it more difficult is, so when all these restaurants shut down, people got laid off, right. people went and found other careers. Mm-hmm. So people that were, you know, for example, servers at Del Frisco's that make, you know, they make a nice living, you know, mm-hmm. they make 60 to $80,000 a year as a waiter. Um, and they had to go, find another career and they did a lot of them went to go work for you know amazon the world and other other things mm-hmm. so when we came back into the business you know the talent pool went to very shallow and then that coupled with the fact that the government was basically paying people uh roughly 21 dollars an hour to stay at home uh made life very difficult for us still and still does. still does so um, i'm glad to see that they finally have gotten rid of the supplemental uh, unemployment benefit to try to motivate people to go get a job. Mm-hmm. I read yesterday that there's a million more job openings than there are people looking for work, uh, which a is pretty, million? a million in the United States. So that's pretty scary in its own right. So finding recruiting and maintaining talent is probably my toughest mm. uh, goal these days that coupled with there's obviously inflationary prices, price changes. We've got, supply chain issues Um, Mm -hmm. so it's been difficult i mean we were excited our sales are up because when people finally got out people are like let's go out and and they're spending money but you know unfortunately the top line is going up but the bottom line isn't necessarily growing much so so what would you tell us as your clientele yeah um what, what would you say to the public uh i would say support your local restaurants um and you know i always tell people you should vote with your feet if if you don't get good quality food Uh, i'd be very patient on the service side knowing that there are fewer people in the workforce that it's very difficult to accommodate guests Mm -hmm. Um, very people were very understanding during COVID. they were you know they were they would tip well they understood what kind of pressure that these people were and this is their livelihood um it didn't take long for the karens to come out afterwards right so people (laughs) would complain and make this and that and i just kind of you know i have to just shrug it off and just like okay yeah. well you know there's one of those people everywhere so i would just tell them to be patient um and support good operators mm-hmm. um i mean somebody made the comment to me the other night they like they came out of our restroom at republic and they're like you know what i love about this restaurant your restroom i said what do you mean because because if the restroom is the restroom is that clean i can't imagine how clean your kitchen is that is and so I said, true. I feel true. that way. Yeah. I so, do. And like, you have Jack Black hand soap in your bathroom. I said, that's awesome. So, <laughs> I was like, okay, well, I'm glad you liked it. I really like you to like the cocktails. But right. If you want to like the bathroom, go right ahead. So, John, if there's one word, uh, I- I'm asking everyone this because yeah. I think it's a, a good question. One word for you, for uh, you, for the rest of this year. I- I'll start by saying, uh, when I ask myself this question, I said, okay, my word, and I came up with it pretty quickly, uh-huh. not everyone does, but I said simplify, because life is so complicated, work can become more complicated, and so that's my word, simplify, and it really has focused me, both yeah. in business and in life, stay focused on what's important, focus, simplify, focus. So what's yours? I'd say flexible. I, I have to be flexible mm-hmm. and uh, adapt. And mm-hmm. so, you know, I don't know what tomorrow brings, right? So I can't, yeah. every day I have to look at the, the business plan again, right? And decide, all right, what's the business plan today? I know what it was yesterday, mm-hmm. uh, especially in the times of COVID, you know, you know, cases go up and at some point, you know, if they run out of hospital beds, they're going to shut down a lot of things again. And I had to be prepared for that. And so how do you prepare for that, John? Uh, you straight stay positive. I really do stay positive. How do you stay positive? Um, honestly, a lot of self reflection and prayer. And, um, I believe um, God's going to help me get through this. And, um, again, I want to protect my team and my staff. I have very low turnover for the reasons we discussed earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people, 
might want to leave for an extra dollar an hour. Or, uh, but at the end of the day, that's compensation. Monetary compensation is really third on the list. It's it's really about the work environment and then the ability to move forward. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned to me, like, what's where's the opportunity? Well, the opportunity for me is for my people that have shown the acumen to manage people. Um, I'm growing, right? I'm adding new restaurants. Um, I also do consulting for other people. So I have um, the opportunity to give them new opportunities. Uh, That's good. Yeah. And then there's, you know, there's people that are basically working their way through college, mm -hmm. uh, working their way through whatever they're working through in life. Um, some people have come in as of late who's like, yeah, I want to make a little extra money on the side. So then it, then it becomes all about training and maintaining the training. Mm -hmm. And so it's every day is a new, a new day and <laughs> new work in progress. So what's the most tenured employee you have? I have employees that have been there since we opened. Is so that yeah, right? that's correct. I have a line, a line chef who's been there since we opened. Uh, most of my staff has been there for over two years. My management team has been there for over three years. Uh, my executive chef and my general manager, James Scholl, mm -hmm. they are amazing people. And they, you know, culture comes from the top, right? Thank you for saying and that. So, Say that again, yeah, please. Culture, right to that camera. Culture comes from the top. <laughs> so people will emulate what they see. And if you treat people a certain way, mm -hmm. uh, and I've had, you know, over my career, I've had all kinds of managers and the ones that were always successful were the ones who were not, uh, uh, would not overreact to situations. They would wait to hear both sides of the story um, because there's always two sides of the story and then there's the real story, which is in the middle somewhere. Right. So uh, if you learn how to manage like that, um, again, connect with your people, show respect. Um, that's another big thing is you treat people with respect. And, we need that right yeah. now, John. And, you know, especially, you know, the hardest working guys I know are the guys that work in the dish pit. I mean, they're up there until... Mm -hmm. You know, 11.30 at night on a, fr a Friday or Saturday night, they're the only ones there that everyone else is left. They're out there having to make, make the kitchen spotless. And, you know, that's why I, that's why I learned their names. That's why I that's take good. an interest in what they do. And that's good. Uh, I will, I don't necessarily handshake anymore, but I'll fist bump everybody when I come in. Mm -hmm. I always come in from the back door. Um, yeah. Okay, I have to ask this about just the restaurant business. Uh -huh. That little movie, Ratatouille. Oh yeah, that was such a cute yeah. movie with the little mouse, and it portrayed the restaurant business to just be awful. And the chef—that's what I want to yeah. talk about. The chef. Um, so, what's it really like in that back kitchen? As everybody's, how do, how do you get the food out? So this—that's a great question, and Thank I'll, you. Tell, I'll tell you why. Because it, it it's a direct follow-up what we just talked about. Because the kitchen will basically take on the temperament of the chef. Okay, so if the Sad. chef is high strung, grumpy, and I've had many of those in my life. You uh, fired them though right away, uh, right? We got, they didn't <laughs> last long, but anyway, you know, it just gets to the point where people emulate what they see. If the chef mm -hmm. isn't freaking out on a busy night and there's 50 tickets on the line and he's like, you know, sometimes the chef is, goes from what's called expo, which is outside the kitchen line where they're making the food. Mm -hmm. You'll literally have to get back on the line to direct traffic, okay, on a really busy night, because mm -hmm. that's just the way it has to happen. Mm -hmm. That's why they make the big bucks. So, you know, and the staff usually, if they like the person and they get along with the person and the temperament's good, you know, it's like, you know, guys in a canoe, they all paddle together. If you get a guy that's, you know, yelling at people and, you know, throwing things around, then yeah, the canoe falls apart. So. Just like in any business. Just like in any business. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, uh, one of the things I have done in my career is, is, is consult people, and it's usually about leadership and culture. And it's amazing to me how many companies um, miss that equation mm -hmm. completely. And usually a lot of times companies, uh, CEOs and COOs rise through the ranks Mm -hmm. but they ne are not necessarily born leaders and they're not necessarily have the tools. They mm -hmm. may be great analytically. They may be very intelligent, mm -hmm. but if you don't know how to manage people, then ultimately you're going to have a problem. You know, that's interesting that you say that because years ago, John, when I started Valerie and company, I didn't know what it would be when it grew up. That's why I called it Valerie and company. Yeah. That's stuck. Well, here we are. It's okay. And here we are. But I actually had someone say to me, 
you should never focus on people skills. I always had the tagline, we focus on people skills. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's hokey because no company will pay you to come in and train people on people skills. Companies expect people to have that. Yeah, right. And it, but John, it devastated me. I was mm -hmm. younger and, you know, rip and roaring and getting mm -hmm. so excited about starting the, the company. And when he said that, it was like cold water just went. Yeah. And I really had to talk to myself about, well, he's pretty successful. He does sales training. And that's what he said. You know, that's measurable, Valerie. People skills aren't measurable. You can't measure it. Companies need to have measurements. It did a number on me. It was mm -hmm. like pouring cold water. And I had to talk about stay positive. I had to stay positive. And I just, I, the only reason I kept going is because I believed to my core, and it proved to be right, that people's skills are where it's at. And you just said that. What is the toughest it's, lesson? It's the most important thing in, yeah. in a company today. And I can say it is measurable because. Oh, good. Tell us. If you have a bad manager, then you're going to have high turnover. And every time you have turnover, you're going to have to hire a placement agency, a recruiter, and then you're going to have to train that person. So you've got your productivity goes down. So, yeah, it's completely measurable. Um, so I, I completely disagree with, you know. He was wrong. Well, and he probably doesn't have great people skills to begin with. So, <laughs> you know, just being just because I can sell you, you know, eyes to an Eskimo doesn't mean I have people skills, right? That's true. It means I'm persuasive. It means right. I'm, you know, competent in, in, in selling, but it doesn't mean you have people skills. And in a world today where there's so much tension um, across the board, depending on, you know, where you sit, um, you know, people skills are more important than ever. They really are. Yeah. John, what's the toughest lesson you've had in business? Uh, you know, I, I I used to be a young firebrand. I'd worked for Goldman Sachs. I had worked in the private equity business, and you know, it was uh, I wanted to get things done. I was always a get get stuff done guy, and except for the S was something else. But I got stuff done, and you know, I would not listen as much as I should. Mm. And um, I had a good, good friend of mine give me the best business advice I ever had, which was, it's not what you're saying, it's how you say it. And so what I learned was, I was trying to overpower to get stuff done, that I would just kind of just, this is kind of what we should do. And what I learned was, you know, I need to listen more Mm -hmm. and get multiple points of view and what I call triangulate on solutions. What does that mean? Triangulate means you get s multiple points of light, multiple opinions. Somebody might bring a, uh, an idea to the table that's something you may not have thought of, right? Mm -hmm. You can never be the smartest guy in the room, right? So you need to you know, listen to other people and take that information and run it through your supercomputer up here and, and make a decision based on that. And sometimes you have to go back and say, we have no solution for this. You know, how are we going to mitigate? Admittedly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's that I'd say that's it. I mean, learning to um, choose words closely and um, mm. think before you talk. Oh, those are gosh, yeah. just boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Those are what we call teachable points yeah. of view. Yeah. Your lessons learned. And that's, you know, when I do consult with some CEOs, it's usually those are the major topics is is really? it's you're a person who rose to your position based on your intellect and not your ability to lead. And a you say that to oh, people? Yeah, absolutely. Usually when I get hired by somebody, they, they have a problem in their company. And I will tell you, half the time it's the guy who hired me. That's the problem. Isn't that interesting? Yes. And so, but at least they knew they needed help. They knew, yeah. The first step is meeting you have a problem. Uh -huh. And then second, yeah. So let's just say there's been some, again, having to think about what I say. I don't just say, oh, you know, you're the problem. I have to sit no, there and go, no. well, here are some tools that we can use. <laughs> have you considered <laughs> yeah, so, all those good open-ended yeah, questions? Yeah. I mean, that's, and there's a lot of companies out there that need that kind of direction. And um, they need somebody like that's been in their seat. So I've been a CEO of a company. I've done been a CEO of a company. So I, I know what I'm talking about. So they'll listen usually. And then you get hubris, which I always, I think we talked about this is the biggest 
deadly sin is the ego factor. It always kills me when you, you know, get these people with ginormous egos and they just cannot see past it. Um, and there's a lot of that. Don't you think sometimes, Sean, that it's a choice that they don't see? That in other words, they don't want to see? Yeah, I think they build up a ver version of themselves that mm -hmm. makes them get through the day. Um, and ultimately they believe the tale. Well, I, I'm grateful for one thing in this pandemic about that topic, and that is that every leader I'm working with and coaching uh, has has shared with me they're grateful for strengthening mm -hmm. their empathy muscle. Mm -hmm. Many of them already were empathetic, like you are. Others were not so much. They were still right. the old you that was driving, driving, driving. Mm -hmm. But every single leader that I've spoken with has said, yes, it's the people side we've got to take care of. Mm -hmm. And so there's some good things that have happened. Oh, for sure. And look, uh, I think it's humbled all of us. It's humbled all yeah. of us. And I think, you know, the ones who didn't get the memo um, mm -hmm. are going to maybe get another shot at it this time around. I'll so, bet they will. Yeah. You know, this has been fascinating. Is there a question I haven't asked that you'd like me to? Uh, you know, we talked about people. We talked about, um, you know, what people can do to, you know, help the restaurants get through this. And, you know, people sometimes don't realize that the restaurant business is the number one business in this country. It's the number one employer in this country. So I did not know uh, that. Yes, it is. So every mom and pop and every corporate restaurant, if you take the aggregate of all those, yeah, that's the number one employer. So if you think about the, um, the people in California and New York, they've been decimated. Some of the best restaurants in the world have shut down. They have. And so, um, you know, all I would say is support your your local restaurants, you know, be patient, mm -hmm. uh, order food to go when you can. And, um, you know, I understand uh, that people can't order out every night for one thing, they'd probably weigh 300 pounds. And then <laughs> secondly, it's expensive, you know, uh -huh. it's not cheap. So, um, so we'll continue to innovate on our side if we have to get to where we don't have as many in, in house dining, uh, customers, but you know, just think about that when you're going out, if you, if you're going to a restaurant that the foods average at best and, you know, go try something else, mm -hmm. you know, go find better restaurants. Mm -hmm. And I'm believing the strongest will survive and, you know, a lot of restaurants survive purely on location, um, but you know, maybe drive an extra half mile or extra mile to try something That's different. True. That's true. Yeah. So, how can we get in touch with you, the audience? Yeah. So, um, you know, I own several restaurants, so I try to keep one email address um, at John at Republic eighteen thirty six dot net. People want to know what 1836 is for. That was the year that Texas declared its independence. <laughs> and Republic Texas Tavern is kind of an homage to the Republic of Texas. So, okay. so yes, you can reach me there and it's J-O-H-N. So uh, send me an email. Um, if you have any questions or are interested in the restaurant business, please don't hesitate to, to reach out. Now, you know what, audience? That's pretty nice. Uh, a man who's as busy as he is with as many things he's got going on in the number one industry in the country, yeah. and you're willing to answer that, those sure. emails. So yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. And thank you for being on the yeah. show. It's been, it's been fascinating. Let's just pray that yep. we don't shut down again, because as you said, it'll decimate so many businesses, particularly in the restaurant. I'm more concerned about the kids, uh, yeah. the, the, not just my younger employees, but the kids in school. Uh, everyone has seen what that's done to families, what's done to kid, kids' confidence, psyches. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it can't happen again. So let's let's hope that our government um, doesn't try to force that. That's what we're all we're all hoping for. Yeah, so well, let's see. I've got four restaurants to go to again, and so do you. Thanks so, so much, yeah. John, for being on the show. Yeah. It's really been thank great. you, Valerie. Appreciate it. It's great to be here. You're welcome. And don't forget two books are on Amazon. I always forget to mention my own book, so I'm intentionally doing that each show. Go buy them, <laughs> support me too. Although you know what? 
authors don't get rich on books. Everyone nope. thinks, oh my gosh, you've got all these books. I just want you to enjoy the wisdom from them if there is yeah. any. I got a few scars myself, John. <laughs> Until next time, stay happy and stay healthy. Bye for now. Another cup of coffee. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for listening. To receive Valerie's voice, free monthly leadership tips, and to learn more about her leadership programs and coaching, visit her website, ValerieAndCompany.com. Next week, we'll be here again to inspire, engage, and equip you with teachable points of view from successful leaders who have been doing it right. Until then, lead authentically.